Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone watching to not harass anyone that's mentioned in this video. That includes us, the people who made it, but more so the person we'll be discussing throughout. I do not endorse anyone to bother him or harass him or comment pointlessly on his videos. If anyone cites us as having sent them or having come from this video, they're lying and looking for an excuse to be a jackass. Thank you in advance for not being one of those said jackasses. Holy shit, that channel that's been inactive for like a year is suddenly posting Deltarune content again? Uh, well, yes and no. This video is a collaboration between me and a friend of mine. His name is Salt, and if you've subscribed to my channel, you would have already seen me shouting out his Deltarune content in my community posts. Hey everybody, happy to be here. I've had a lot of fun inflicting this theory on, I, I mean, um, sharing this theory with Cookie. I'm really excited to continue digging into this. There is so much more to talk about. This video, the one you're watching right now, is the second part of our collaboration. So yes, I'm literally forcing you to go support my friend's channel in order to have context for my video. On a real note, Assault's content is genuinely good and I can't recommend it enough. It takes a much more grounded and literary approach to examining Deltarune and, if you know me, you know that's the only kind of theory I can genuinely engage with. The theory we're discussing, one from a... renowned? Infamous? Uh... From a Deltarune theorizer that has a platform is one that infuriates me to no end, and if you want to see the true depths of my rage, again, go watch Salt's part one first. Now, without further ado, let's continue from where the other video left off with... Jabal's assumption is that determination works the same in Undertale and Deltarune, right? Especially in the context of Flowey and Darkners being objects, but like... Why would Determination even bring these lifeless objects to life when Flowey was only brought to life because he was the only flower in the garden that had Azrael's ashes, and the other flowers used to carry Determination are still lifeless in Alphys' lab? If we really wanted to use the logic that Determination is the same in both games, that'd mean that every single Darkner we encounter is actually a dead monster's ashes that have been brought to life with Determination. Jaru, get in on this! This is way darker than that Azrael thing! In Deltro, we see that Lightners have a tradition to bury their dead's ashes with an item associated with said person. If we were to believe that Darkners are dust-covered objects, like Jabra's theory implies, then how did they end up being used daily, or being in a school closet? Like, there's an endless rabbit hole of extinction events and tragedy that we can speculate about until the end of time when we assume that dust-covered objects would come back from the dead, so to speak, if given determination, but all of that ultimately makes the dichotomy of Lightners and Darkners pointless, because at that point it's the living versus the dead, which doesn't seem to be what Deltarune is setting up at all. What I mean is, Darkners aren't Lightners, nor direct representations of Lightners. The best showcase of this is the fact that the old, drawn picture of Gerson never came to life in Chapter 1, so why would Azrael's dust supposedly come to life as something that's Azrael, but not really Azrael at all? What purpose does it serve, narratively, when Darkners otherwise can't literally embody Lightners? We're coming back to that idea of what does Rousey mean to Chris, and here, I'd like to add what Flowey meant to his family. No matter what form he took, Flowey always represented Azrael, especially Tutorial and Asgore. When Flowey didn't tell her who he was, she still saw him as Azrael in her half-asleep state. His purpose is never anything but Azrael to the characters around him, so why would it be different in Delta? If you think Frosty is exactly like Flowey, and if Frosty is effectively Azrael to the people around him, then... Whoops, you just implied an incest again. <laughs> Jaru brings up some potential counter-evidence by addressing the idea that Flowey couldn't feel emotions, therefore Darkner shouldn't be able to feel emotions. Of course, you may be wondering, why does Rouse have emotions when Flowey didn't? Why do any Darkners have emotions if the process that created them is so similar to the process that created Flowey? Don't you need a soul to feel emotions? He brings up examples of when Flowey felt emotions. This is honestly fine for counter-evidence, but it's gonna backfire spectacularly for Jaru in just a moment. See, he says the reason Flowey is evil because of the way he was created. Being made by a scary machine in a scary lab from the souls of dead children was what made Flowey evil. Why did he struggle to feel love? It's because of how he was created. Flowey was created when a nightmarish machine forcibly extracted the determination of murdered human children and injected it into a flower. He was created under hellish circumstances, so obviously he would struggle to feel empathy. He will then go on to say that Rousey was created by Chris killing their own brother accidentally. Apparently, being killed by your own sibling is not traumatic according to Jaru. You see how this falls apart from just a quick glance? Not only that, but he asserts that the process that creates Darkners gives them love, hope, and dreams. 
How does Jaru know this? The fact that Darkness have those things now does not imply they got them when they were created. I know I'm being a bit of a hypocrite here by repeating myself, but I'd just like to remind you of something. Almost everything we've talked about so far is completely irrelevant because Darkeners are not objects brought to life. His entire theory is based on this completely incorrect premise, and even if you accept it as true, it's still filled with more holes than a fine Swiss cheese. Now, I could end the video right there. Ah, <sighs> if only. The next segment is by far the most frustrating part of the whole video. If factual errors, contradictions, and crazy conclusions weren't enough for you, then hold on tight because we're about to get into some character assassination. Jaru is about to make a bunch of claims about how different characters would act in a certain situation. As we'll explain, he's gonna get it all horribly wrong. Claim number one, everybody ask Chris to speak to Asriel. Have you ever wondered how people keep up to date regarding Asriel? How they know that he's away at college? How they know he's coming home soon? It's simple. They ask Chris. We are not starting off good. Jaru's claim here is truly bizarre. There is absolutely no evidence here, and it took me ages to piece together why he would even say this. I think the reason why is that Jaru sees people asking Chris about Asriel while we are playing the game, so he assumes that the other characters would only ever ask Chris even before the game started. We don't see people ask any of the other dreamers, so Jaru assumes it could never have happened. It's like he doesn't have object permanence except for lore. I'll explain even though I don't think it's very necessary. Who else are people going to ask when we're playing as Chris? We aren't controlling Toriel or Asgore, so how would people ask them? Also, people know how much Chris likes their brother, and Chris doesn't talk to people often, so it would make sense to ask about Asriel now that they have the chance. Claim number two, Toriel gives all of her kids phones. We know Toriel happily gives her kids phones so that way she can check up on them. She even did this in Undertale. Surprise! It's Undertale favoritism again! That happened in Undertale, Jaru. You want to give me some proof that that's the case in Deltarune? I mean, yeah, it's likely that Azriel and Chris both have cell phones, but why is that the primary and only way to contact someone in Jaru's eyes? Alphys mentions Chris staying up late talking to Azriel and explicitly says they can't do that now because the internet's out, implying Chris and Azriel wouldn't be using actual phone lines or text messages to communicate. And, like, makes sense? Azriel already has college funds to worry about, why would he be racking up an insane phone bill too when he can just use the campus's Wi-Fi or something? Especially if Chris and Azriel are doing this for hours and late at night. Hell, maybe Azriel is specifically using his phone less because because he thinks everyone is going to keep him busy for hours like Chris and maybe even Toriel do. Claim number three, Toriel doesn't know how to use email. Toriel uses one at work, but we have no evidence that she knows how to use email. Surprise again! You didn't think that the Undertale favoritism was over yet, did you? Jaru baselessly asserts this because Toriel doesn't know how to text in Undertale. That's because in Undertale, she was isolated away from the world for centuries. She has a computer in her classroom. What else would it be used for? Minesweeper? Jaru, if your evidence comes from Undertale one more time, I'm just gonna put it in the trash without talking about it. Claim number four, no one would try to contact Azriel on their own. This isn't something Jaru says directly, but it's hanging over this entire section. Are you seriously telling me that everyone would just blindly accept what Chris says for months? Give me a break. Let me paint you a picture. Toriel, single mother of two, just saw her oldest out to the bus leaving for his college. She waves him goodbye, wipes away a tear, and her and her youngest go home to a much emptier, quieter house. She's worried, as she always is, that something is happening with Azriel that she can't help or influence. As she watches Chris walk down the hall to their classroom the next day, she, again, thinks about her oldest, as she passes the locker that used to be his. In what world, dear viewer, would Toriel of all people not call Azriel herself at any point? Send him an email if his phone isn't working, continuously bothering him because, as it was established oh so many times, both in Undertale and Deltarune, Toriel is the kind of person who repeatedly calls her kids over the smallest things. If she can't call them, she texts. She answers the landline phone without issue at any point of the day, even when there's a guest over. Really, there's no shortage of ways Toriel would go out of her way to contact her son on her own. Push comes to show, she'll email the goddamn university. She has no shame. Claim number five, Chris would prank their brother with a knife and also make Ralsei's outfit as a costume for some reason? 
Several months ago, right before Asriel was about to head off to college, Chris, late at night, went up to the school. Why did they go up there? Well, Chris had seen this really cool video where a man created a super sharp knife out of jello, and that gave Chris a great idea for a prank. They would dress up like a monster using their favorite plastic devil horns and a green robe and would hide in the closet at the school. Chris would then jump out and startle someone with their knife, much like how they jump scared Noel in the past. Asriel noticed his younger sibling sneaking off, and since he was a responsible older brother who did his best to make up for Chris's bad behavior, he followed Chris to make sure they didn't cause any trouble. And so, sneaking into the building, Asriel discovers Chris inside of the closet at the north end of the school. Asriel barges in, intending to interrupt whatever prank Chris was performing, only for something terrible to happen. Chris, startled by the sudden appearance of their brother, trips and falls, and in doing so, accidentally stabs their beloved older sibling. Asriel, grievously wounded by Chris's knife, dies in Chris's arms. So yeah, I'm gonna deal with the stranger assertion first. Why on earth would Chris make Ralsei's outfit as a costume? What would they even be dressing up as? Also, outfits change when they enter the Dark World. Why would it stay exactly the same? Now for the stupider assertion. Of all the pranks we've seen Chris pull, none of them have been remotely dangerous. Why would Chris do something like this? Don't you think there'd be some kind of indication of this? If Chris was doing dangerous and risky pranks all the time, I'd understand. But this is completely out of left field. Jari made a comment in a recent video about how the details of his story don't matter. He says it was a mistake to go into detail when what matters are the core points. I disagree. The details are how you connect the core points. I know I'll get some Jaru fans telling me that addressing this claim is pointless, but it really isn't. These details are necessary for the whole thing to work. How Chris kills Asriel is not a minor point. You need to show that it's likely or even possible for that to happen, Jaru. The details matter. I'll agree that the whole thing about the costume doesn't matter that much, but it's so silly that I can't not talk about it. Claim number six, Chris is shocked by Ralsei's appearance. So imagine Chris's shock when one day upon going to that dreadful closet, Chris stumbles into a whole other world. And in that world, they discover a person that looks shockingly similar to their dead brother. What? Where? Let me, okay, for the love of God, let me play you the exact scenes where Chris first sees Rossi's many forms. First, with his cloak on. Hmm, oh yeah, that sure is surprise if I've ever seen it, but okay, how about the time we see him with his hat on? Yep, still not affected. Okay, how about when he takes his hat off? Okay, see here, Susie is surprised, but Chris? Yeah, no, nothing. And that's not to say that Chris can't emote. We see unused prides of them blushing, and we have seen where they act out on their own volition, divorced from the control of the player. And here, when you see Rossi's face for the first time, nothing. If you really wanted to stretch it, you could say Chris was shocked so much they couldn't move, but like, doesn't it make a lot more sense if we interpret it as Chris being a lot more used to the sight of boss monsters than Susie is? She's shocked because she's thinking, holy shit, that looks like Chris's mom! Meanwhile, Chris is thinking, oh, he's a boss monster, haha, <laughs> called it. Like, how else would you interpret the literal lack of reaction here? Chris isn't shocked, they are in a phase, and saying that they are shocked is just well, I'd call it a borderline lie. At least provide some reason for why you interpret their polar opposite reaction that way. Claim number seven. Chris wants to go back to the Dark World, even after a snow gave run, because it's their only chance to bring their brother back. Something that you guys brought up in the comments, and which was a major point in a video by Andrew Cunningham, is that it doesn't make sense for Chris to make this dark fountain if you partake in the Snowgrave route. The whole debate about why Chris opens the fountain in the Snowgrave run can be a bit tricky because we can't really come to definitive conclusions until chapter 3 is out. That being said, this conclusion is so absurd and based on so many faulty assumptions that I feel confident in saying it's outright wrong. 
There are tons of way more likely explanations than Chris trying to find a way to revive their dead brother. One explanation could be that Chris is in a safer environment. They're at their home with Susie and their mother who are both capable of noticing if something is off about them and putting a stop to it. On top of that, the police are on their way. Jaru also uses an Andrew Cunningham video as part of his evidence here. Jaru very clearly didn't watch or at least understand that video though, as it completely disagrees with this assertion and another one he makes in a little bit. You can't cite people who would actively disagree with you on this point, Jaru. Claim number eight. Chris is running out of time because Toriel asked when Asriel is coming back. Furthermore, Chris is running out of time because someone, probably Toriel, asked Chris when Asriel was coming home for summer vacation. Source, please. Jaru says that Chris... <sighs> Lied about their brother going to college, kept that lie up for at least half a year, implied more, and then, and only then, did their mother ask when Azrael was coming back. And they said, in a week. Instead of saying fucking never or something. This theory is just Deltarune the idiot plot. Okay, okay. I need to run this back from the very beginning and actually explore what the scenario Jaro described would look like if all the characters were actually in character. Uh, first of all, Chris pranking their brother. Uh, not only would real Chris's prank be tamer and not involve a knife in a dark room, but we have no evidence that they pranked anyone other than Noelle in their childhood, but whatever. Let's say that this one time, Chris decided to be a huge asshole and prank Asriel by jumping him with a knife. Okay. Uh, problem two is how the fuck would Chris get to the school to do this and why would they do it there and not at home or something. Uh, whatever, Chris is being a dick. They stole their mom's keys to the school, then told Azrael to meet them there. Here's how that scene would play out if everyone was still acting like themselves. Was supposed to have stabbed Azrael too, right? Next, Jaro talks about how his theory has some gaps in it, but defends this idea because it answers so many questions. To be clear, I know that I am filling in a lot of gaps in order to justify my theory, and that my evidence is limited, but you cannot deny that my theory answers so many questions. We talked about how this is a weak defense, but it's even weaker when you point out the gaps in your theory, especially since the gaps in your theory can be easily answered by other, simpler theories. Your theory creates more questions than it answers, as we've pointed out already. We've got more questions than we started with here. How is there not a missing persons case around Azrael yet when Batan seems to have experienced a similar tragedy with Des? How has Chris been keeping up the charade? How does Rossi not remember being Azrael but Flowey has such vivid memories of being Azrael? Why doesn't Queen recognize Rossi as Azrael and put him in the corresponding room? Why would Chris open a dark fountain in their house and bring their mother to the dark world if she were to see Rossi and then know something happened to Azrael? Why does Rossi have so much not brotherly affection for Chris but not anyone else? Why does Rossi even have special powers if for determination to warn the same voice as the Undertale all the doctors would have to be made a monster dust? Why does Toriel not even try to? And remember how I said that the Andrew Cunningham video he mentioned debunks one of his later claims? Yeah, it's time for that. I am going to give an answer to a question that you have all been asking. And that question is this. Who is possessing Chris? Jared claims he can answer who is possessing Chris. I don't know if you watched the video you used as evidence, but you really should because it's going to prevent you from looking very silly. Andrew Cunningham highlights something that I also agree with, how narratively unsatisfying and nonsensical the idea of three souls is. I'm not saying you citing something from his video means you have to agree with everything the man ever says, but if checking your sources gives great counter evidence to the theory you're trying to push, then you'd be better off getting new sources. Better yet, maybe you should reconsider the theory altogether. This answer, that the player is the one possessing Chris, has never sat well with me. Why? Because the player easily controlled Frisk in Undertale. Remember what I said I would do if you brought evidence from Undertale again, Jaru? The 
The reason Chris is able to rebel is because we have never been controlling them in the first place. Chris is not the protagonist of this story. What gets me about this line of thinking is that Jaro is essentially equating Chris to Frisk in every way, as if different people couldn't have different reactions to the same situation. Ignoring the fact that Frisk is a child and probably couldn't tell or didn't care that they were under someone else's control for a while, Chris is distinctly a troublemaker and someone who values their place in the world. If someone came along and started pulling on their strings, of course they'd hate it. They've been controlled and sidelined in a lot of ways in their life, but the player coming in as the most explicit one, giving Chris an easy target to hate as they grow into their own. Just because Chris and Frisk don't explicitly tell us how they feel at all times, like other characters may be inclined to do, doesn't mean they feel nothing at all, especially knowing the shit Chris pulls at the end of every chapter. If I may take a moment, I'd like to mention this overarching idea of Chris isn't the real protagonist that has been plaguing the fandom since chapter 1. Jodo's version of this argument is uh, probably the most bad shit, but I think everyone in this community has by now heard the interpretation of Susie being the real main character. A lot of people feel and think this because Chris is an unconventional protagonist, who both doesn't speak, but also isn't a straightforward way for the player to be inserted into the story. And Chris is a complex person, but because meeting that person takes a lot of extra steps and reading into a lot of flavor text, people usually dismiss it. It's easier to empathize with Susie or Noelle or hell even Asriel, because all of them have, at one point or another, near explicitly told us why they do what they do and how that makes them feel. Chris never did, and I think it's unfair to Chris and their role in the story to dismiss them as the protagonist on the grounds that they aren't perfectly heroic or outwardly expressive. Chris is being controlled and possessed by the soul of the brother that they killed. Okay, so somehow it makes sense for us to be controlling Asriel, who is in turn controlling Chris, instead of us just controlling Chris. Why is Asriel this middleman? This is needlessly complicated. Just cut Asriel out and you have literally the exact same setup, except it actually fits with the story the game is trying to tell. Also, if Asriel is controlling Chris, then why is he lying about his own death to everyone? How do you explain when Asriel gets full control and when he doesn't? Jaru doesn't give an answer to another very important question. What is your freaking obsession with Asriel, Jaru? Rossi is Asriel, Chris is Asriel, is Susie also Asriel? Is the entire prophecy just four Asriels in a trench coat? And here is another claim that really annoys me. Jaru pushes the idea that Deltarune will tell the same story as Undertale. We should have seen this coming! The answer is so obvious now that I see it! Toby Fox, that sly dog, is telling the exact same story again! Not only does this display an incredible ignorance of Deltarune's story as a whole, but it also shows a disrespect to Toby Fox in my opinion. The only way you could believe this is to fully immerse yourself into Jaru's story and completely forget about, you know, the game's actual story. Tell me, how do Susie and Noelle fit into this? Heck, how does Ralse fit into this? This whole theory was supposed to be about him, but you've just spent it talking about Asriel. How does any of this connect to the story arc that Ralse is experiencing? On top of all this, Toby himself has made it pretty clear that the games have different stories. I talked about this in my video on Undertale favoritism, but I think it's important to repeat this point because I want answers. Jaru, do you think Toby is lying to us, or do you just not know about these tweets? And don't tell me that the stories are technically different from each other. This is the same story. You said it yourself. Toby has never outright lied to us about something before. Sure, we've had red herrings or clues that were missing the context required to fully understand them, but that's nothing like what people have to assume about these tweets. Unless Toby is lying, your theory has been confirmed wrong by the author himself. Think of the ramifications of this. Jaru, I think Cookie and I are the only ones doing that right now. <clears throat> the consequences of this theory are as follows. Toby is a liar who deliberately told us Deltarune would be different and excited that people are seeing it as separate from his last game only to make Undertale 2. Ralsei and Chris's innocent romantic interactions turn into a worrying incest subplot where Azrael reborn as Ralsei has a crush on the sibling that killed him. Susie has unwittingly befriended her way into a family murder plot when all she wanted was friends who understood and liked her. The player's role is relegated to Azrael's conscience instead of an ever-present hand of influence that narratively represents fate itself, the exploration of choice being mute if we are, indeed, just acting as the characters we're playing as except we aren't playing who we think we are. Toriel 
well as were actually horribly neglectful parents who never bothered to contact their son who is out of town for months, maybe years, on end, instead just trusting that Chris will do it and be an adequate emotional support for their son when he's in a difficult and stressful situation. Hometown is full of complete imbeciles who didn't notice another one of their young neighbors went missing because Chris told them he was fine. Noelle as a character is obsolete and is only here to be Susie's love interest because her evolving interactions with Chris are rendered pointless as Azrael can easily take credit for the good and the bad aspects of their new friendship instead of, again, the player acting as the hand of fate instead of a literal person that the characters can know and understand. Del Toro is just as real the game, as all characters that are important to the plot are either not actually important to the overarching narrative, notably the female characters, or are as real. And here we find the piece de resistance. I mentioned this before already, but I'd like you to watch as Jaru does our job for us and debunks himself. On the one end of the scale is the regular, uncorrupted Azrael. This version of the character has experienced no trauma and is thus pure and kind and would never hurt a fly. On the opposite end of this spectrum is Flowey, who has experienced all of the trauma and is thus capable of atrocities on a global scale. The Deltarune Azrael exists somewhere between these two extremes, as he is traumatized, but not to the extent of Flowey, which means that his corruption is not guaranteed. That's why Snowgrave is an optional route as opposed to a guaranteed route. Azrael being killed by his own sibling is traumatic. So then why is Rouse not evil? The process that would have created him would have been traumatic just like Flowey. Or is that arbitrarily not traumatic enough? Actually, now would be a great time to address how Jaru treats trauma. I've tried to be nice so far, but this is where I need to be a bit more harsh because Jaru is making light of something that impacts a lot of people's lives. This is an insensitive way to talk about such a serious concept. Trauma doesn't make you evil. It's not a sliding scale. It's complicated and much more nuanced than more trauma equals more evil. I understand that we're talking about Asriel's experience specifically and not trauma as a whole, but this is still a dramatic misunderstanding of how trauma functions. What gets to me is the blatant misuse of the word sociopath. Jaru, sociopath is not a catch-all term for mentally ill people who murder. Sociopath is a specific mental condition wherein someone is literally unable to empathize and feel another person's pain, to put it as stupidly simply as possible. People don't become sociopaths due to extreme trauma. Sociopathy is like clinical depression in that regard, where circumstances can make its toll on a person in their life more severe if left untreated. And for the love of God, Azrael isn't a sociopath. He is capable and even abundant in empathy and feeling things for everyone and everything all the time. What he goes through through as Flowey is depression. He shuts down. He can't feel love. He can't feel passion. He doesn't even feel sad. He just feels empty. He's a child. He blamed this on having lost his soul, but in reality, he's just not grieving properly. He went through something awful and never took the right steps to cope in a healthy way, nor was he given proper help by the people he turned to as his parents are just as horrendous at grieving as he is. Flowey is not a heartless murderer. He is not a sociopath, and he wasn't turned evil by trauma. He's a horribly emotionally unstable child who went through an unspeakably traumatizing death was reborn in complete darkness, rendering him terrified of the new life he was given and proceeded to detach himself from the world he's in as he discovered he had control over what can and can't happen in it, rendering that power his only coping mechanism. It's kill or be killed is his way of rationalizing what happened. It's all a game is his way of justifying why he's hurting the people around him. I'm Flowey, Flowey the Flower, is him distancing his new identity from the one he had before, donning a new mask in order to keep some semblance of identity after his life was taken at such a young age. Trauma does so much more than to you cartoonishly evil. It's never that simple. It makes you question who and what you are at your core. It leaves you at times paralyzed and at others doing things you wouldn't otherwise. It changes you and not for the better. It's an everlasting wound that can't be healed, only treated. And if it's not, it becomes near impossible to coexist with. Flowey isn't a sociopath. He's a scared child. Those aren't mutually exclusive, but you aren't using the term in good faith, Jaro. Educate yourself if you're gonna talk about trauma and mental health. Now, I do want to make it very clear, I don't think Jaru did this intentionally. I don't think he's a bad person, but this was really careless on his part. Jaru should be mindful of his implications, especially when he's talking about a serious subject matter. I don't want to turn this into a lecture, but this whole thing made me feel uncomfortable and I felt like we had to address this. To wrap up this theory, he talks about how Deltarune is the dark and more mature version of Undertale. He uses Alfie's anime review as proof of this. But the reality is that Alphys' anime was a metaphor for Undertale and Deltarune. The first anime was cheerful and optimistic, just like Undertale, because that was the timeline where it was possible to give everyone a happy ending. But Deltarune is not that timeline. Deltarune is the darker sequel that isn't afraid to treat you like an adult. 
To give him half credit, some of this evidence isn't from Undertale, but I still find it to be weak. The Mew Mew and Mew Mew 2 are representations of Undertale and Deltrune is an interesting interpretation of otherwise unimportant flavor text. What's important to note here is that Alphys is not an objective critic. She's citing things she specifically likes or dislikes about either anime, and this could in turn be seen as still be criticizing his own games, but not putting either down as a story. The criticism for Mew Mew 1 is that it relies too heavily on slapstick and nonsense, having flashy things happen constantly in order to keep the viewer arbitrarily engaged. And that's something that can be argued for Undertale. For all its genuinely heartbreaking moments, most of the game is spent dicking around the underground and watching wacky people do wacky things. Mew Mew 2 is criticized for having taken the story in a completely different direction and going for a story that is nothing like Mew Mew 1's. Sound familiar? That's exactly what Toby wants out of Deltarune, a different story with different themes that acts as a spiritual successor to Undertale instead of its sequel. Treating Deltarune as a sequel to Undertale literally goes against the Mew Mew reading, Jaru. I wanted to highlight how Jaru claims that Deltarune is darker and more mature, and that's why his theory is correct. First of all, your theory is not dark. It's edgy for the sake of edginess. Second, if you think this is what makes something more mature, then I don't know what to say. Being depressing doesn't make a story more mature. If that's what you think being an adult is like, then I'm sorry for whatever horrible experiences you've had that have led you to that conclusion. On top of that, the only way this interpretation of Deltarune works is if you ignore all the happy parts of the game. I could easily make the case that Undertale is the darker game by doing the exact same thing. This is the game where six people are murdered to be used as tools for a war against their own home. This is the game where monsters are experimented on in the hopes of saving them, only to have it fail and horrifically mutate them instead. This is the game where an entire kingdom is so desperate for freedom that they are willing to kill a child just for the chance to see the sun again. See how any game can be made depressing if you just ignore everything but the depressing bits? Try it at home! Leave a comment turning your favorite game into a depressing disaster! Ha! Yeah. Like, ooh, Hollow Knight is a game about a lost royal heir coming back to their ruined kingdom after years and years of exile only to learn that their place in the world is either futile or only there to perpetuate the death and stagnation of their homeland at the expense of their own life. <laughs> hey, wait, that is the plot. There's no other way to summarize it. I also wanted to point out how nearly every example Jar gives of the game being depressing is just another example of his Undertale favoritism shining through. Let's take a look at some of the examples he gives. This is the timeline where Gerson never got to be a legendary hero. I mean, he also lived a peaceful and happy life as a teacher and author, with a loving family at his side. Being a war hero is not as happy as you'd think, Jaro. He had to live with the trauma of experiencing a war. Deltarune Gerson is without a doubt a happier ending, even if he did pass away. This is the timeline where Asgore is a disgraced former police chief struggling to pay rent. Yeah, and in Undertale he was a king that lost his entire family and was now forced to kill people in order to try and make his kingdom happy, thinking so lowly of himself that he was willing to let you kill him. Undertale Asgore has it worse by far. He's depressed either way, but at least he's not suicidal in Deltron, you know? This is the timeline where Undyne and Alphys don't even know each other. Look, Alphine is a top tier ship, alright? But they're both living happy lives. Also, we can help them meet each other. Even if they don't end up together, does it really matter so long as they're happy? Your favorite ships can't always be canon, buddy. I've watched part of Jaru's ship video, and he doesn't even like Alfine that much. I have no idea why this is even a tragic thing to him in this video when he actively called Alfine and not being a canon a good thing in the ship's video. This is the timeline where the Amalgamates never got closure with their families. First of all, you don't know that. But also they weren't, you know, turned into the Amalgamates in the first place? They never had to live as horrible abominations in a near constant state of agony? The fact that they didn't have to experience that trauma, even if they got a happy ending eventually, is still a good thing. This is the timeline where you don't get to see Papyrus. Because Papyrus would give you too much hope. Are you kidding me? Are you seriously telling me that not seeing Papyrus is so soul-crushing that it would make you lose hope? Sure, it'd be cool to see him, but that doesn't make the game depressing to not have Papyrus. Also, prove it! Using the information you had at the time of making this video, I want you to prove with 100% certainty that we will never see Papyrus. This is ridiculous. If you miss him so much, go play Undertale.
Whew. Deltarune is a narrative with a cohesive story. Its themes are interwoven, and its characters are treated as people, not tropes. Jada's theory completely decimates any serious reading of Deltarune, flattening it into a meaningless, edgy sludge, there only to try and re-strike the same heartstrings as Undertale did. That's not what Deltarune will do, and that's not what you should expect or focus on. If you don't like what Deltarune is right now, that's fine. You shouldn't try to cling to this game in a desperate hope that it'll be Undertale 2, because it won't be. Trust me when I say there's things in this game to love and appreciate that have nothing to do with Undertale, but if you don't like those bits, you're free to leave. This theory was, supposedly, about Ralsei. In it, Jaro did not discuss Ralsei's issues with identity, or his role in the story, or his role in Castletown as the sole protector of the Grand Dark Fountain. Jaro discussed Undertale and Azrael and murder. He glanced at Ralsei, taking only his tropes and surface-level image as a means to create an entirely unrelated plot that rendered Ralsei as an identity meaningless anyway. Jaro, you just made an AU! Stop pretending this half-thought-out speculative nonsense actually has a chance of fitting into Deltarune as a whole. Yeah, I'm going there! This theory is garbage, and even that's giving it too much credit by calling it a theory. Jaro effectively he literally killed Ralsei as a character by making a plot about Azrael getting murdered. He implied incest, trauma that doesn't count as real trauma, pacifism being the same as obedience, and so on. Let Ralsei be himself for fuck's sake. He's a dumb teenager in over his head, he likes baking in order explaining things, he's emotional but not empathetic, he's smart but not logical, he's obedient but not a doormat. Why were none of Ralsei's real character traits and themes discussed in a video supposedly about him? Oh yeah, because this stupid fandom is obsessed with Azrael and can't fathom the idea that a character can be similar to another without literally being the same person. God. Does Ralsei really need to be a different, pre-existing character for you to see him as a person worth talking about? What part of Ralsei do you like if you strip him of his connections to Azrael? Because if you can't answer properly or genuinely, it means you don't like Ralsei at all, and that's fine! You don't need to have nuanced adoration for every main character, you don't need a direct reason for why you vibed with Azrael but you think there's something fishy about Ralsei. It's fine to be disappointed that your favorite character from Undertale isn't in Deltarune, and I promise you, you don't need to make theories about why your Undertale fave is actually the most important person ever. This isn't just about Jaro. This this is about all the people speculating that Sans is a darker, or that Papyrus is the knight, or hell, even I'm guilty! I thought Azrael would be the angel because he was an Undertale, but now Noel has more of a chance of that role than he does. Can we just let Undertale go, guys? The story is over. There's no need to try and expand on it further. If you want to make a use of it, no one is stopping you, but for fuck's sake, can we stop talking about Deltarune as if it's just Undertale with a shinier coat of paint? Please? <sighs> all in all, I consider that Space Gore must be canonized. Hear, hear! I think by now we've highlighted all the key issues with Jaru's theory. Originally, I was planning on going into more of Jaru's theories, but I quickly realized that they all have pretty much the same problems. Most of what I said here applies to the others. It's all Undertale bias and assumed conclusions left and right. Once you pick up on the core problems, it becomes impossible not to notice. I realize now, after spending time looking into what potential rebuttals from Jaru and his fans might be, that I am not very likely to convince anyone. I knew that from the outset, but I truly did not realize just how differently Jaru and I approach theory crafting. I like to focus on what's most probable. I want to avoid assumptions and extrapolations to get the most accurate conclusion I can. I don't think that's what Jaru cares about. Honestly, it made this whole video feel almost pointless. I only decided to go ahead with this video for two major reasons. After I watched Jaro's videos for the first time, I was shocked by the overwhelming support they got. I felt so alone seeing absolutely no pushback to these, let's be honest here, pretty blatantly wrong ideas. Sure, there are people pushing back, but it's buried deep in the comments and behind closed doors in Discord servers. My hope is that anyone else who felt like they were going crazy seeing no one push back doesn't feel as alone as I did. The second reason I kept going is because I don't think it's fair that theories like this get to have their cake and eat it too. They get to be serious predictions while also being just fun and silly ideas that cannot be critiqued. If you want to have fun, that's fine, but I am free to disagree. That doesn't take away from your ability to have fun and enjoy these theories. If the story is what interests you more, then clearly the evidence never mattered in the first place, so me discussing the evidence shouldn't impact your enjoyment. Right? But I do understand that critiquing a theory you like or that you made can feel very personal. I wouldn't be surprised if Jar is upset at me to some degree. Hopefully it's very clear that I just wanted to bring up some counterpoints and have a little fun. I don't want him to stop making videos or leave the internet or whatever. I don't hate Jaro, I just don't like his theories. With all that being said, thanks to everyone who stuck with us this far. Hopefully you learned something, or at the very least had some fun along the way. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.
This is the timeline where Grillby's went out of business.